Hi guys, welcome to episode 11 of Jewish Agnostics, and this is our third book review. I know, it's a lot of book reviews, and we've done a lot of them. Um, and here we have Martin Bodick. His 11th book is Zadie's at War. Um, Oz can show you the book, uh, and yeah, we'll be going into that today. Yeah, so you have the nice flags, it's really cool. Um, and there's a really cool catchphrase at the cover of the book, um, so we'll be going that into that today. It's the same structure we have a before reading the book section and an after reading the book section so you get the best of both worlds I um, mean if you have any comments or concerns I could forward that on to Mr. Bodick and that could be answered um, so yeah is there anything else you want to say Ms. Bodick? I'm very eager to partake in this uh, broadcast I like what you guys are doing I appreciate that you like the book cover a lot of thought went in uh, on the cover what is inside the book um, into it a great deal of thought. It's filled with symbolism. Uh, actually, when I when I go out of my book talks, I spend a lot of time discussing the cover because it basically represents, if you look at it and if you've read it, you'll see how everything ties on the cover into the content of the book. So it's pretty cool. Thanks for having me. Yes. Of course, any, of course, yeah. And having read the book, you could see all these flags right here. And of course, I don't want to give uh, away too much just in case uh, our readers are planning on reading it our, themselves. But um, it's it's a great foreshadowing, if you will, starting from the bottom to the top. And with that in mind, I think we could uh, begin with our first book question. Okay. So our first question is, how is Zadie's War different from other Holocaust stories or stories about World War II? So we know that the adventure is unique to your grandfather, but are there any takeaways or goals that you instill in your book that separate you from the relative plethora of Holocaust literature? Uh, so the differentiator for this book and uh, what made it a very easy sell with the publisher was that um, most stories you hear of World War II follow certain templates, certain uh, archetypes. Um, so your relatives and my relatives, besides for Zaidi, uh, all survived uh, I broke it down to like six categories. Uh, you could have survived the concentration camp, survived on the run, uh, survived in hiding, um, hidden uh, by a non-Jewish family, uh, got out of Dodge before the war, um, lived through uh, everything while you stayed in place. Uh, people who lived through the bombing of London know what that was like. They just stayed where they were and they just endured. And kindred transport. Um, not too many people survived on that, but it's famous. So those were seven categories. So my grandfather's story is not that is not that story. It's everything but, um, which makes it wild. Uh, the first the first major differentiator is that he served four armies uh, in four different crazy ways, and nobody does that. What do you mean four armies? It, it requires explanation. It requires a whole book to explain. So. Um, some people serve one army, and that's great. And some rare ones serve two. And uh, the example of that is the lone soldier, um, which used to only refer to an Israeli soldier who uh, doesn't have a support network, uh, who's an American and decides to sign up. Uh, but in fact, it's become uh, expanded. Uh, lone soldier is now referred to uh, Ukrainian soldiers who sign up and don't have a support system because their support system has escaped the country. So Ukrainian soldiers are now being referred to as lone soldiers. So that's how you could serve two armies. If you serve your national army and you serve the army of another uh, nation. Now how the heck do you get to four armies? That's in the book. Uh, so the fact uh, that he served four is already dif the differentiator. Obviously I put that phrase in the cover to grab people's attention. Uh, and that's yeah. how this book stands out. That's really how this book stands out. It's, uh, it's a completely outside experience of, of the typical experiences that you heard of. Yeah, and even reading this story, I was I found myself uh, amazed really each time where the story would go, beginning with the, I don't I don't really want to spoil too much, but he began with the Romanian army essentially, and then over time, really switched sides throughout the story until finally, ended up in the USSR and then emigrated to Israel. So I just it's what a wonderful story, I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Yeah, Appreciate yeah, it. that was really cool. Um, and then for the next question, um, 
what made you write your 11th book about your grandfather's experience? Um, just like an extra question. How do you think he would feel if he read Zadie's War? Ah, okay, so uh, I wrote my first book in 2010. Um, I self-published most of the initial books that I wrote. I've always wanted to be a writer. It, was, it felt like it was part of my DNA. Um, and I kept cranking out book after book after book. Uh, I've published some parody Haggadot that you might be aware of. Mm -hmm. I wrote uh, the Emoji Haggadah, the Festivus Haggadah, the Coronavirus Haggadah, the Shakespeare Haggadah. That's gotten a lot of press. Um, but I didn't want to be a one-trick pony. Uh, so I had to write yeah. something serious. So actually, the collection of this story began in 2000, newly married, and my wife had a gig in the city as a shelf's helper. 2003 was uh, when I sat down with my grandfather uh, because I was, I was like, what do I do with my Thursday nights? I'm open. So I gave my mother a call and I said, uh, you know, the stories that, that Zadie keeps telling, I think it's time to collect it and put it together and we'll see if I can make a book out of it. So we sat down for several successive Thursday nights until he started uh, repeating himself. And that's what we knew. They pretty much collected the entire story, but I wasn't a writer yet. I didn't know how to do it and what the business was like and so forth. So uh, it's kind of sat on the shelf. It, it sat uh, on uh, um, and the VHSs in a, a box in my mother's house. Uh, I think you guys might know what VHSs were. <laughs> And once I started cranking out books yeah. uh, and one after yeah. another, I was like, okay, I, I understand how this works. I know the business. Uh, I've gotten some contracts and relationships with publishers. It's time to, uh, to package this up and reach out. So I uh, reached out um, to Amsterdam Publishers, which is the largest uh, publisher of Holocaust literature in Europe. And as well, uh, we... we uh, wrote up a contract real quick. They said yes immediately. Because uh, once they saw that it was uh, four armies and everything else that was attached to the story, and including the backstory, because I made this pitch and got working on it. That's the story of how the, the this book came to be. Um, and now that I've established myself as a non-one-trick pony, I'm working on the next couple of, uh, of Haggadot, but uh, heavily marketing this one as we speak. Uh, as for the yeah. second question, the second half, uh, question two, yeah, uh, yeah. what would my grandfather yeah. think? He was very nonchalant. Like, I know that he was proud of me for a great deal of things, um, but he was the kind of guy who wouldn't praise anybody in person. He'd praise people behind their backs. So I'm a marathon runner, um, and he never really told me that, like, what I was doing was cool or interesting or go get him. But I always heard from my mom and my cousins that he's really... And then he'd praise me behind my back to somebody else. Really into this running thing that I do. So I, I can't even imagine, like, if I would have, uh, like, handed him the book, he would be like, uh, all right, very good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, sorry, you're back from here. Yeah, oh, so so that, that's, uh, that's how that would roll. Well, Jewish grandpa. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's cool, that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> Your bio states, I am a technologist by day and a writer by night. So, I mean, I read technologists <laughs> and I'm like, like, what does that mean? Like, you use your computer? Like, I don't know what that means. Uh, so, so what is a technologist? And are there any similarities between a technologist and writer? Are those like two different complete... Oh, boy, topics? let's see. So, a technologist is just a, a nicer question, way of obviously. saying I'm an IT huh. guy. Very simple. Um... My, my major oh, in college is okay. management information okay. systems. Um, so I actually do what my major is, which is kind of a surprise because not everybody gets that lucky. Um, so my degree is what I do. So this doesn't is not a fit for the publisher, which is why it's published by everybody else. Um, I manage um, the help desks around the globe for a major publisher that support uh, internal employees. Um, ironically enough, what I produce, uh, the rest of my books, and maybe one day, I'll, uh, uh, they might be interested in something that I do, but that, that's basically what I do uh, from nine to five. Um, I make sure, I provide um, assurance that people are getting good service, that the uh, IT service, that's basically what I do. Um, as for uh, if I am currently working on a book and heading towards deadline, 
that's what I'm doing. I'm burning the uh, a writer by night is, is uh, you know, when the, the when I punch the clock, uh, basically I, I start writing. Um, and when people go to sleep, uh, midnight oil at both ends, I'll go to, I'll get to work after people have fallen asleep and I'll continue working before everyone gets up. Uh, and that's what I do at night. When I sleep, I don't know. Uh, I'll sleep when I'm dead is a famous saying, so we're going with that. Um, and there's plenty of overlap uh, as far as writing goes. I, I, you know, in a professional environment, I have to uh, crank out uh, communications, so I'm trusted to, to be the proofreader and the writer. Um, so there's a little bit of overlap there. Um, and I enjoy writing uh, wherever, wherever I'm doing it. Uh, that's uh, always, always what I've wanted to do. I've, I've said that, um, you know, many skills, um, you need to really have uh, a, a 10,000 hours of, of, of practice in order to get something done. Right. There, well, there, there are some skills that they yeah, just don't have. Yeah. I mean, uh, like yeah. American Idol is the proof. I mean, if you don't have a great voice, then you just don't have a great voice, and you can practice till kingdom come. But, but with writing, yeah. they say no. uh, they being uh, writers like uh, Stephen King and Elmore Leonard and and Kurt Vonnegut, uh, they say in order to be a great writer, uh, you first have to be a great reader, and it is easy to be a great reader. You just have to read. Uh, so uh, voracious reading when I was a kid put, put me already halfway uh, to writing mastery. So I love reading. Uh, I've loved reading since I was a kid. I used to, uh, when I was a kid, six, seven years old, I used to read Guinness Book of World Records, cover to cover, every encyclopedia brand, or was crying out. Baseball Digest was um, still, uh, yeah. still the little postcard. We all did that. Side. Yeah. Uh, and that's where it yeah, started, and I've been yeah. insatiable since, and I've always wanted to put out and produce what I enjoy the most. Uh, I enjoy music, but I can't make music. I don't know, I don't know how that works. I, I can't pluck a guitar, I tried, but I can write. Uh, so this, so this, is, this is what we do and why we do it. I think that's very interesting because with most people, it's really like a spike. You know, you're doing one thing and you're gonna continue with that. But with you, you're able to balance this full-time career and then also maintain this successful passion that you have so i think that's thank very, you very much uh, yeah, i, I do my best balance both of those. obviously i've got a dream about uh, becoming a full-time writer we're not there yet uh but slowly and surely and surely you know we put out a book after book and find successes here and there and uh we'll get somewhere do you think if like uh do you think if like you turned like full-time writer like that would kind of take away the like joy you get from no, it no 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 Oh, heavens no. turn from a hobby uh, to a job. It's just, or... it's just what I love doing. Um, I do it now basically for free. <laughs> so uh, if, I'm, if, I'm actually, if it's actually paying the bills, can you imagine the joy? Uh, it would be fantastic. It would be fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So speaking of, uh, just moving on to our next question. So speaking of writing and literature, um, this interest in Jewish uh, literature, uh, why are you interested in Jewish literature rather than those of other cultures and stories? Or I guess to better phrase that, what's the what's the appeal of Jewish literature? I know I have one shortcoming as a writer. I can't plot mm -hmm. things well. I couldn't create fiction for the life of me. Uh, like I, I cannot think on a level of Agatha Christie or or. Uh, or any uh, or Arthur Conan Doyle, uh, Sherlock Holmes. Those are things that my imagination is not really good mm. at concocting. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So I write what I know. Uh, I fell into uh, my first emoji Agada by accident, um, uh, totally by accident. Let's see, we can veer off there, I think, for a second, because mm -hmm. it'll give you some insight as to how I roll. Um, uh, we dressed up as emojis one Purim, and uh, with the Shalach Manot, I put in a little paper that I converted the Megillah, Megillah Esther, into emoji form. And it was like a summary sheet and had our names on the bottom. And I was looking at it and I was like, what can I convert this into, you know, full uh, box or package uh, that would be interesting? Um, and I knew nobody's, nobody's going to sit down and decipher the Megillah Esther uh, emoji yeah. where, you know, it's said quickly and you're riffing through the pages. It's not working. And I thought, you know what? What about the Haggadah? 
and then we were off to the races. And then they're just one thing after another. <laughs> so I write what I know. I, I love comedy. I'm a fan of comedy. I'm a fan of uh, breaking down comedy to its elements. It's, it's why I'm probably Seinfeld's biggest fan. Uh, he spends all the time just, just picking on things. If you ever watch comedians in cars getting coffee, he's trying to craft jokes. Like, let's see, I can make it a little better if yeah, you change yeah. one line. So um, I write what I know. I am Jewish and I like writing and I like Purim and I like Passover, um, but I'm also uh, beholden to my family um, and I want to, to have its legacy remembered and I want my grandfather to be memorialized. Uh, and I want his message of, of life and hope to go out into the world. Um, so that's what I know as well. Um, and and that, that, that's pretty much it. I, I write what I know. Uh, the maxim is true because that's what writers should be doing. Uh, you want to take risks and try a, a, a field or a genre that you're not good at, go right ahead. But, but you want uh, satisfaction at the end of the day. So I'm, I'm proud of all my books uh, because I'm, I'm, I'm proud of how I put them together. I, ju I just write what I know. So said that about five times. <laughs> I'm stuck on repeat here. Uh, but that's basically, basically, basically how it is for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you, right where you know. Yeah. Um, okay. Would you ever, like, try to know different cultures or, like, different other, like, things and then maybe write about that? Or, like, do you just want to, like, stay um, within Judaism? No, and uh, it, like, I have many book ideas. I actually, I put out um, a little newsletter every year, and I call it Martin Bodick's uh, Book Report. And I let people know... Um, how my publishing endeavors are going, like I, sales figures, and the several ideas that I'm working on uh, for other books. So I have about 20 ideas floating around in my head. Um, the non-Jewish ideas, um, uh, in order to pursue them, I would have to make a living as a writer because I'd have to start traveling and going to interesting places, interviewing people. I can't do that right now. Um, and that's why I'm stuck, although it's not a sad uh, stuck. It's just that that's where I am right now. In order to be an investigative journalist sort of uh, um, writing person on the, on the level of like uh, N.A.J. Jacobs, uh, for example, I have to get out of my box here and start traveling. Mm -hmm. So those ideas are on the on the burner right now. As soon as I can get to them, you know, I'd have to be a little more successful in my writing. Then we start branching out big time. Or, yeah, it's actually oh, really yeah. cool. Yeah, and now uh, focusing a bit more on the novel itself and less on the background. So, how does uh, Ben Zion, or as we all know him, Zaydi, manage to keep his faith throughout the events that have occurred? Because uh, it, it's really interesting to us. It's a question that we've asked a lot, and as a uh, I guess you could say almost a religious podcast. We'd love so, to know. Well, what do you uh, think? What's interesting, the secret especially for that? our purposes here, and especially for the for the title of your show, is that I did ask my grandfather when he had time to be a religious person at at any point in in his adventure, and he said to me, I remember he looked at me with like he was incredulous. He said, he said, pray. I'm I'm trying to survive. I'm just trying to get to the next day. What do you What do you mean? I got I got no time for for religious practice, and and that's another departure from the typical stories that we hear. You usually hear like, you know, oh they managed to find the potato and they yeah. managed to light a light for the menorah on Hanukkah, or somebody managed somehow to get a pair of tefillin, and those stories are miraculous in and of themselves. But my grandfather actually put that on a complete break for for uh, four and a half years, I think it was. Uh, and then he continued where continued on his religious path just as soon as yeah. he got home, uh, which is kind of remarkable um, and very surprising because you do not, I've never heard anything like it. I've heard of people remaining faithful. I've heard of people abandoning their faith entirely, but I've never heard of a person uh, uh, taking a break. That's literally what he did. He was like, I am trying to make it to the next day. I gotta do this. I gotta chop trees. For these Russian soldiers, I just gotta get messed up. I gotta find something to eat. I I got no time for anything else. And that was, that was basically his mode of of life. That's uh, that's what he was focused on. Yeah, because it's incredibly interesting. Because uh, early on in his life, he was focused on uh, studying the Torah and Talmud, 
And then later on in his life, he was also focused to, uh, focused on studying the Torah and Talmud. And then in the in the middle, I mean, there's barely any mention of it, but it's just, I think it's very interesting how you could just take a pause instead of really having to either keep your faith throughout or just abandon it. Abandoned yeah. it entirely I mean, in the face certainly... of the adversary. Exactly. I didn't. So, I didn't. Those, I didn't explicitly state break. in the book that that he took a. He was surviving. He was in the act of survival, and that's why he survived because of his focus. Break. Yeah. But it's evident. Yeah, but uh, for like a lack of reader, like... like yourself. That yes, that is what's going on. He, he just he, he, um, every day he needed to feed himself. He needed to do what he needed to do. He needed to stay out of certain people's faces. Um, and he needed to embrace others, and that was part of it. It was a survival strategy, and it worked. And uh, it's why I survived, and it's why I got to be here, because he took a break. During like his later years, like when you you heard this story, uh, what were his views on God and, and well, it was, religion? He was a devout when he had uh, time to think uh, about Hasidic it. Hasidic Jew, um, and I never really uh, got into theological matters uh, with him, but. Uh, I grew up at his side, and I, I took cues from him, um, and uh, was, I'm approximately as devout as he was, I suppose. Um, I learned, I, as Yogi Berra said, I observed a lot by watching uh, from him. He was, uh, he was a guiding light. We never really got into um, deep theological discussions. Um, he just uh, acted and lived, and um, um, showed by example. You see. Very interesting. Yeah. Um, Stephen, you want to go on to the next yeah, question? Yeah. Um, so, on page 32 to 33, and this isn't the book specific part yet. Um, okay. You just want, like, it's just like good reference. Frame of um, like reference, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You can see how the Holocaust occurs gradually. Mm -hmm. And what do you think is worse? a gradual change like to a country or an immediate change that we see later on um, with different countries and ideologies that is a great question you're saying what's worse a gradual removal of human rights or a sudden one? Oh my gosh yeah like with Romania as you said in the book or you know suddenly as it occurred with some countries throughout history yeah, like how Poland had just been wiped, or um, like Anschluss. I or definitely even botched under that name. The, even under okay, the USSR, with um, sudden is you know worse. all these new countries they um, they were stripped of rights very quickly. So, all right. So I'm going with this is a very specific question. Wow, because you have got to get an opportunity to get out. Uh, because once the gates are locked, uh, you're not going anywhere. Um, I actually was, uh, I'm, a, I'm a fan of geography, um, so I listened to Geography by Jeff today on YouTube. I was interested to know why he thinks um, North Korea is the worst place in the world and the least easiest to escape from. Um, and that's because their gates are locked. They, no one is going anywhere. And if you suddenly strip people of rights and the inability to move, uh, I, all hope is lost. But if you are wise enough uh, to see the writing on the wall and things are happening gradually, you may have an opportunity to get out. As we know, um, the, the gradual rights removal in Germany and all over Europe uh, at Germany's behest uh, wasn't easily seen uh, by everyone and they got trapped but there were opportunities to escape. Um, so I'm going to say that suddenly is worse based on the fact that gradual gives you an opportunity uh, to save yourself. I believe. Yeah. Because I was, I was always thinking of the side that went, well, okay, fine. Gradual, at least you can escape, but at the same time, you're really witnessing this all unfold, like the destruction of... Because all of these countries were just bastions of culture and had strong Jewish community, and you're just seeing that slowly be destroyed before your eyes. So I always thought that was something Philosophers will disagree with me, but... Uh, as well. 
I say it was a spontaneous question to me. <laughs> so uh, we're going with that. I mean, it's, it would be horrific to watch things unfold yeah. uh, emotionally, personally, but but, but, Slowly. but it just still like allows you a chance to get out. It gives you, it gives you a long view, and, and it's sometimes surprising. That's you read right. many, That's many right. Holocaust memoirs, and, it's like, and, and the thought is, what are you still doing there for the love of God? It's because it's because home is home. Um, yeah. There yeah. are uh, famously there there are islands in the Caribbean where volcanoes are just uh, destroying the mainland, and people just live offshore in their little boats and they wait for things to subside and they move back. Home is home. It's hard to escape, um, and so and then it becomes too late. Yeah. 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 Exactly. And also, like, the fact that, like, no, no matter how much you can predict, I mean... No, not really. No one Sometimes really uh, predicted it's what denial happened. and denial and denial. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to... Yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to get too yeah, much into so politics, but boom. the way things are running in the United States, yeah. there are flashbulbs and signs and red flags going on all over the place. We're ignoring everything. And we think everything's going to be okay. Maybe, maybe not. But... Well, and there are certainly some people who are, who are like, uh, we'll all out. right, we're going to Canada or Israel or somewhere else. Uh, for some people, they, they see the tea leaves. Uh, some people are like, home is home. Yeah. Home is home. I mean, yeah, it honestly just depends. And like, there are so many times that are like, that aren't necessarily like with the Holocaust, that there are seemingly red flags and a lot of people leave, but that's not necessarily like the best move. And honestly, just like that attachment to home, no matter what logic pulls you out, you still have an emotional attachment that brings you in. Most people stronger. on earth move uh, not more than 20 miles from their house. I don't know what the percentage is, but it's a large one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I remember seeing a statistic earlier. I don't want to like say the exact statistic because I'm not sure, but I know it's like 80 to 90 percent. The statistic is older because of now globalization, but 80 to 90 percent of okay. people marry it people um, within <laughs> 10 miles of each other, which is crazy. Yeah, I mean that's how the world was for the longest time. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So, I guess talking about the uh, what what was going on within the countries. So, why do you think that some people like uh, Miklos Calais, so he was the Prime Minister of Hungary, I believe, and what he actually resisted some Nazi persecution against the Jews. So, why, why do we think that he chose to guard against Nazi oppression? Was it out of practical benefits, like uh, what Jews did for the economy? Or do you think there was also maybe a deeper moral reason as to why these people Ooh, wow. to really resist um... this powerful nation? I uh, profess a little bit of ignorance with, with his motivations specifically. I, I didn't research it much. Um, I would mm -hmm. like to, to give him the benefit of the doubt and think, uh, wish for him that he saw value in Jewish humanity um, uh, and so forth. Uh, but he paid the price, uh -huh. uh, I, I do know, for, for his, uh, his stance of turn. But... Um, um, We'll give him the benefit of the doubt, and that believably complex. Um, I don't know more about him personally and specifically, so I don't want to speak out of that he so a value. Uh, and, and sometimes we wonder about even when moral people make uh, uh, don't make the right decisions. We know that um, the tracks to Auschwitz were not bombed, and that was something that came up repeatedly again and again and again and the, the, the allies yeah. never pulled the yeah. trigger on moral that. Guy. never it's a it's a huge moral failing and we wonder what's what's going on in the background i mean we have parallels nowadays uh ukraine uh is is a parallel for a lot of things there are things we are not yet doing for them that we really should be doing it's like we give them just a little bit and a lot of people a lot of leaders in uh, in world war ii were, were stuck uh, between Axis and Allies, trying to figure out what the appropriate thing to do is. Um, yeah. 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 
And it happens with, honestly, like, every war. Like, I mean, you see, like, the My Lai Massacre in Vietnam and, like, the atrocities in Iraq and yeah. Iran. And it honestly, like, doesn't necessarily stop in these moral convictions are kind of what we need to contemplate beforehand so that when we get into the situation, it's something that we, like, it's not like a split decision, which is what led what yeah, leads to yeah. these it's, issues it's, recurring. It's massively complex. Yeah, and even like the Uyghur and, uh, Muslims you know, countries in that are in China, business now in Russia, they've um, got their own motivations. Uh, there are some slaves, really hard decisions you know, being made at the time. Trying to produce the materials uh, for the factories. I want to wish that's another that moral issue. Anyone, that's, that's why I'm just really happy doing what I do. <laughs> convoluted. What's up? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hang on. And, uh, yeah, Stephen, so, uh, yeah. To move on with that, oh, yeah. Gosh. Um. Wow. So we noticed in the That's book, like, around page survive. forty-six, you talk about oh, hopelessness gosh. and, like, oh, how would man. you say, given your grandfather's story, and just in your words, wow. how do you survive wow. hopelessness? Ooh. I thought I wouldn't have anything Where to offer on the uh, theological uh, concept. Now you're asking. I, uh, oh, yeah, my gosh. Yeah. They... <laughs> they get better. Like, look, I can uh, look, think uh, about how it's, it's, it's common to me. Oh, my promise. gosh. Like, if you're in a hopelessness, <laughs> if you're in a hopeless state and you try <laughs> to, to get out of it, I mean... Um, we can if, circle if back to it. If a person can like, put himself yeah, in the mindset yeah, it need to be. of... A small goal is all that's necessary to get myself <laughs> to the next step and then a little goal beyond that. So I mentioned before I'm a marathon runner. So there are a lot of people who say, don't think about the finish line. Think about the fact that you have to get to the halfway mark and then you have to get to the halfway mark after that. And some people break it down even further. Some are like, all right, look, it's a 10 miler, a 10 miler and a 10K. Okay. And some people go, I just need to get to the next traffic light. Once I've gotten to the traffic light, I see another traffic light, and we'll try to get to that one. So I think that's uh, a good way to approach hopelessness. I just, I need to make a single gain that's attainable, and we got it. We can nail it. We can nail it in small chunks, then we can nail the next one. And at the end of the day, you've accomplished something great. I don't know. Term paper is another example. You can't think, I just need to get to the end. Uh, I need to write a paragraph. That makes sense and is solid and bite -sized I'm proud pieces. of and we will we'll work on the next one um and i think that's a, a simple life approach that could apply here if um just just take micro baby steps and you can you can get yourself to the ultimate goal in the end and do not be dissuaded do not one one anything at a time one anything this is to broke it down to the smallest things Yeah, I think that's yeah. a very healthy approach to life in general. Just one day at a time. Take it as you will. Um, yeah, yes. yeah. Right now, it's uh, from here on out. It's going to be really uh, comments on the book. Let's so questions. So I guess we want to tell our audience. Uh, yeah. Um, please stop <laughs> if you don't want to. Yeah, get, yeah. Get so I'm gonna, on anything. Yeah. So I'm gonna end this recording. Um, and then we're going to have another one. We'll just film right after. Uh, thank you guys so much for watching. And please buy Zadie's book. Link is in the description. Everything is in the description below. Um, and yeah, Oz, do you want to show one more picture of the cover? Yeah, sure, sure, of course. Um, here we go. There I it recommend is. it. We recommend it. So. Oh, there we go. Yeah, oh, <laughs> and we don't want to judge a book by its cover. But the cover is pretty nice. And the book is good as well watching stay tuned